Welcome to Healing Generations, a podcast creating a dialogue uplifting the importance of healing, strengthening, and supporting our communities, and that addresses the disparities and inequities in communities of color. Healing Generations is brought to you by the Healing Generations Institute, a collaborative initiative of the National Compadres Network and the Brotherhood of Elders. Be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on our new releases. Oh, Meteorola. Welcome, everyone. My name is Jerry Teo, and I want to welcome you here to the Healing Generations podcast, sponsored by the National Compadres Network, Brotherhood of Elders, and the community as well. Uh, we thank you for joining us today on uh, this platica, this dialogue, this journey that we uh, have taken to really lift up the medicine and the teachings and the wisdom of our ancestors, and at the t- same time, you know, address the the cargas, the the struggles, the battles, the trauma that many generations have carried, in order that we can transform those and and address those and fight for, you know, equity and justice, but also for peace and tranquility and harmony in our lives. So I want to thank you for joining us today. As we begin, you know, today I want to want to thank Creator, thank the ancestors, thank all our relations, you know, for or being present, invite them to come in and guide us today. And as we thank those ancestors, I want to acknowledge your ancestors, wherever you're from, wherever you're sitting, you know, bring your grandmas and grandpas and great relatives in, you know, they've done so much for us. They've left us teachings and blessings and traditions that way. We give thanks for, you know, people of all races, of all lands, of all prayer ways, you know, we acknowledge all of those that are, that are offering blessings, but those that are struggling today too, we want to bring those prayers in to help them that way. And for the people on the land of where you're at, I'm on the Tangva Gabriendo land, but but any relative that is there, you know, and where you're sitting, uh, please take a moment to take a deep breath and just acknowledge the, that they are the caretakers of that land. They're the original people of that land. We also at this time acknowledge the people in our barrios and our neighborhoods, uh, you know, the OGs, the big mamas, the veteranos, the you know, the grandmas, the grandpas, the young ones, you know, all those folks in that community that you live and serve, we acknowledge all of them today and collectively ask permission, you know, to be here for another day. We give thanks for this uh, this time for us to be able to, to share and to dialogue and to get a little bit closer to that sacredness that we all carry today. So thank you very much. And you know, as we begin today, I want to real, real blessed to, to have, you know, a, a brother, I consider him a brother, camarada, you know, warrior spirit warrior on this path, you know, and who I've known for a lot of years, man, you know, it's, 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 <laughs> as time goes by, you know, do we just see how long we've, we've, you know, been on this road and, and uh, really honored to have, uh, you know, Dr. Roberto Sintli Rodriguez uh, with us today, you know, has many, many gifts and many contributions that he's made to the world. Uh, you know, he's a journalist, columnist, author, you know, academic, you know, a uh, former professor at the uh, University of Arizona. He's uh, published many, many books, Our Sacred Maiz, the, the Writing of 50 Years, uh, and, you know, Yolki as well, you know, along with a number of other writings. He's a prolific writer, you know, thinker, a doer, advocate, you know, justice warrior, and just a good dude, you know, just a good dude. You just, you know, we've known each other for a long time. I remember meeting you, Roberto, back at uh, Lowrider Magazine, you know, when you were writing there, and and, <laughs> and I was uh, contributing a little bit, too. So so I want to thank you, brother. You know, I know you're in Mexico, so so it's, it's beautiful that you're coming from that original land there, and just want to welcome you and, and give you the opportunity to welcome the listeners. Yeah, thank you very much, Jerry. Yeah, you're right. We've known each other quite a while. I first want to acknowledge my parents. You know, they're no longer with us. I live close to where they were born. They were born in Mexico City, both of them, and then migrated to Aguascalientes and Tijuana and then Los Angeles. Mm. I was taken at four years old to Tijuana and then on to East Los Angeles. It's a a spiritual but also a physical journey, Mm. you know, that a lot of us are on or have been on, you know, because I think... I don't know, maybe I just thought of it as a spiritual journey or a political journey, <laughs> but now it's physical too. That is, I'm back. You know, I was born in Mexico, so most people refer to me as Chicano. You know, mm-hmm. in my mind, I think for about a good 10 years, I've always referred to myself as Chicano also, but I never stopped seeing myself as Mexicano. 
because mm-hmm. that's what I was and am. <laughs> so I just want to say that where I chose to move to is Teotihuacan. Teotihuacan is about 30 miles from Mexico City, and it's an incredible place. I go to what people call the pyramids, to the ceremonial site, almost every single day. Mm. And sometimes I don't go in, but it's like right in front of me. My house was one block from the Pyramid of the Moon, and it's, it's quite amazing. I made a conscious decision to go there. I'm sure there's other underlying or subliminal or spiritual reasons mm. why there. But all I know is that I was drawn to it like a magnet. And even in 76, the first time I ever went there, I stood at the top of the pyramid of the sun. And when I climbed down, I went to the right side of the pyramid. And I walked about 100 steps and something was protruding. I dug it and it was an arrowhead. Mm. I still have that arrowhead to this day, Mm. 47 years later. I have a staff. It's a family staff. It's dedicated to my parents. Because I was blessed with knowing that I was Native, that I was Indigenous through my parents. My first nickname is uh, Cinquete, which means Mm. serpent that drinks milk. (laughs) My mom gave that to me when I was about five or six years old, not knowing that it was Nahuatl. You know, now I have a few other names, like you said, Dr. Sintli. You know, Maestra Mama Cobb gave me that name when I received Mm. my PhD. And I was given another ceremonial name when I turned 52. But, you know, that one I don't really do in public. But thank you for inviting me. Again, it's a long, long time. Mm-hmm. Lowrider was like late 70s, you know, yeah. early 80s. And for me, it doesn't even seem that long ago. And yet, of course, mm-hmm. most people around weren't even born in the 70s or yeah. 80s. You know, <laughs> So, yeah, quite a long time. Thank you, brother. Talking about your, your familia you know, coming from Mexico and then Tijuana and then East L.A., you know, and you mention a spiritual journey. You know, I mean, it's often that the Spirit guides us, leads us, you know, protects us along the way. But I know that journey is not an easy one. And I know especially for your parents, probably immigrantes coming from Mexico, going to Tijuana and then coming even to East L.A. was, you know, probably not an easy journey. And for you as a young child, you know, I'm sure there were some challenges, some uh, some struggles, some confusing times. But, you know, along with that, there's always the blessings. And I wonder if you could reflect back a little bit on your parents, a little bit on that journey, a little bit on that, you know, that travel. Yeah. And talk a little bit about those challenges and also talk about the blessings that you, you know, that you gained that, you know, were part of that 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 journey. Sure. I might forget, so remind me, but I was going to mm-hmm. tell you, my, my PhD was based on my father's consejos. You know, his stories when I was a little kid, five, six years old, mm. and a little bit from my mom too, but it was mostly my dad. You know, he guided me. And uh, I'll give you an example. I mean, cause I, I, on top of being an academic, I'm a storyteller too. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I'll tell you a couple of stories that relate to your question. So again, being about five or six years old, I didn't understand why they would call us wetbacks, you know, why, mm. you know, in Spanish, mojados, you know. So I would ask my parents, you know, I said, ¿Por qué nos llaman mojados? ¿Por qué nos dicen mojados? And uh, the, the conversation was in Spanish, you know, because I didn't know English at the time. And so my parents said, you know, don't pay attention to them, you know. I said, we didn't swim across the ocean to get here. And I, so at that age, like five or six, I mean, I understood what my father was saying. Because it wasn't like, it's like a double message, you know, double mm-hmm. meaning. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't so much that, Europeans had come across the ocean, but that we hadn't. Mm-hmm. So what did that what did that translate to for me? It translated that we were native. You know, we were native to these lands. We didn't we didn't come from afar. Mm. Now the confusion part, which you alluded to a second ago, I, I don't know that I expected that, but yeah, we, we grew up on Whittier Boulevard in East LA. And most people looked like me, you know, in those days. Yeah. But those are the ones who used to call me wetback, you know, or mojado. And they were very vicious, you know. My mom was wet, you know. And they would treat my mom just as bad. I think a lot of it had to do with language, you know. So one time I asked them also, I said, ¿Por qué no hablan español? Hmm. And again, this was my dad. He says, don't pay attention to them. It's because they don't eat chile. 
<laughs> and again, at five, six years old, I went to the refrigerator, grabbed the jalapeno, and I almost died. <laughs> at six years old or you're five and a half, whatever it was, I knew what chile was, and you know, I stayed away from it. My mom used to cook it, right, because the fumes and all that. But I ate it, and I said, I'm never going to be like that, you know? Mm. So I was telling you, I know all of us got it. Maybe my, my oldest brother worse, you know? Because, mm -hmm. again, I was only five or six. But I used to be my mom's translator, you know, at mm -hmm. five, six, seven years old. And something about color, of course, right? But language, you know? My mom, I mean, it was vicious. I would hear the people, you know, I would translate and the people at the stores and stuff, you know, that's, I think once in a great while you would see the signs that would say, se habla español, but that was rare in those days. Yeah. So, yeah. So my mom would speak Spanish and they would talk to her real vision. So I would have to translate. So I never forgot that, you know, that combination of language. I think, I don't know about for me, because for me, I think it was very much color. But like when police later in my life, you know, would harass me and stuff, I think my last name also had to have something to do with it, or maybe my full name, because you know when when cops when they run a make on you, right, right away they they can't tell your color by the name, but they know that Gomez, you know, or Gonzalez, you know, symbolically or it means brown, right? Yeah. So I got I had all of that, you know, I, all of that in my life. I seen that with my family or myself. And of course, neighbors and on and on. Uh, you know, as I grew up, I had a heavy accent, as you could imagine, you know, uh, probably at six, seven, eight years old. In my mind, I think I got rid of that accent when I went to junior high school because it was a, a new school and people there didn't know I was from Mexico hmm. because I think because of the language. But yeah, so lots of phases. So I want to comment a little bit on what you just shared in, in you know, the stories of your mom and dad, because I don't think people really appreciate the spirit damage, you know, the, the trauma, the, the what. And, and you as a little boy at five or six, you know, hearing these things. I remember that too. I remember hearing those things said about, you know, people that you love, your mom, your dad, your grandma, you know, and it's like you translate, but it's like, you know, similar to you, my older brother was, was kind of the, the one that had to carry that. And what do you do with it? It goes inside of you. It impacts you. It makes you feel a certain way. And, you know, for some of us, it gets us angry. And we go to school and then we're angry little kids or we're, we're in the street and we're angry little kids and, and even at home, you know. But, you know, potentially what, what that does too, if we're not getting the consejos, if we're not getting the blessings, if we're not getting the teachings, then it begins to change even the way we look at our parents, the way we look at our skin color, the way we look at our language, you know. Fortunately, you had that chile that you, you went and bit. <laughs> that kind of, your dad gave you a very practical way, eat some more chile, mijo, <laughs> you know. And for good or for bad, I think, you know, our foods, our traditions help keep us close sometimes because we got, you know, the strength and what people don't realize is the medicine with even our foods and our and our music and our you know our stories that help keep us grounded and I think you know I would say that's why you're such a prolific storyteller you know because those stories are part of what's kept you connected and so now you enter junior high right mm -hmm. and you enter junior high which is you know a critical phase in adolescence you know where identity is such a critical thing who are you and you've um, you know, if you will, lost your accent. Your accento. You may not need as much chile or something, but but now, you know, it's not so distinguishable and you have a choice, right? But now you face junior high and the things that, that come into play, the Chicano movement, and we're seeing the injustice and all of that. Tell us about that phase. Yeah. Well, you know, probably in my family of nine, I was probably the only one that got into the Chicano movement heavily. Mm -hmm. My oldest brother, he would always tell me, why are you doing that? You know, they don't even like us. You know, you're not a Chicano. Because I know he used to get it heavy too, you know. But I remember I used to tell him, this movement is precisely about what you're talking about. Hmm. You know, that is, they didn't seem to be proud of who they were. Now all of a sudden they're proud. And so in my mind, I go, that's what the whole idea was about that rather than be against Mexicanos or maybe Central Americans, it was a thing of embracing the culture 
fighting for human rights, fighting for social justice, and on and on. And I saw that as very much universal. My older brother saw it as like, yeah, but that doesn't include us <laughs> because they hate us, <laughs> you know. And it's true what he was saying. However, it was changing, you know, because I'm talking about 67, 68, 69. You know, things were starting to change at that time. And I don't know what, I, I'm sure there's something psychological. Again, we use the word, I do the word spiritual. Mm -hmm. Something spiritual must have happened where I was attracted to that and wanted to be a part of it. And I just saw a need because I remember as a little paper boy, I used to deliver the paper on the east side. I think part of my route was in Montebello too. In mm. those days, Montebello was very, yeah. very white, number one. And number yeah. two, the Mexicans that lived there used to see themselves as Spanish, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I, I remember hearing stuff all the time, you know, just on my bike, passing by houses and hearing stuff. So I, I just thought that the Chicano movement was something radically different, you know? And the walkouts were important in 68. You know, our, our school walked out too, but mm -hmm. to this day, I don't even know if we were part of that. But I do know that we, in the eighth grade, we had a walkout. Helicopter mm -hmm. showed up too. So it was the, to me, the death of Salazar yeah. was probably the most radical thing that happened for me. I mean, I, I got affected by the killing of John F. Kennedy, you know, Martin Luther King. But I think 70, you know, and uh, Salazar and the three other people that got killed in the moratoriums, that affected me too. But I think for some reason, Salazar just resonated, mainly because I think we were all watching it on television, you know, yeah. because it was nightfall already. And his, his compañero there, Restrepo, I remember he was frantic and saying, Salazar is inside the bar. You know, we lived a few blocks down the street and we went over there, but they wouldn't let us near there, you know, because they had blocked everything off. Mm -hmm. So... Of course, when we knew that he was dead, you know, I, I think for me, it's just, that was a radical thing that happened. You know, I think there's certain turning points in, in life that for me, that was one of them. Well, maybe the killing of uh, Santo Rodriguez out of Dallas, mm -hmm. that, that was pretty mm -hmm. gruesome too. Yeah. But I think the thing with Salazar is just brought it home, this idea that they could kill anybody. And I remember my parents, I was an athlete as a kid. And uh, even now I still get on my bike every day. Mm. But I remember going out and my parents called me back in. I was on my way to a baseball game to play. And they called me in and says, look, we need you to watch this. And so it was uh, Ruben Salazar on television mm. talking about Chicano power and this and that. And, and they told me, they could be careful. You watch. They're going to kill this guy. And sure enough, when they killed him, my parents told me. I guess, didn't we tell you? And so that was like a warning. But for me, it, it had the opposite effect. That, that is, I got into the movement full-blown. Yeah. And I think another reason is because we used to live in an alley on Whittier Boulevard. And I remember right after he got killed, they were patrolling our, our communities, you know, like every day. So I was playing basketball in my backyard, and the ball went into the alley. And a sheriff went by, slammed the brakes, and started screaming at me to get out of the alley and kill my house. And I told him, this is my house, you know. I said, get out of the alley. I said, well, this is my backyard. Hmm. So it was just... You know, I was only, what, 10th grade at, at the time, you know. I, I still thought that was bizarre. Yeah. I remember telling him, I go, I live here. <laughs> the, meaning, mm. the, the second meaning was, you don't. You know, yeah. I, this is where I live. But I think after that, you know, it just became, I, I guess nowadays people use the word warrior, or in, mm. in those days, soldiers, you know, <laughs> soldiers for the movement. Yeah. So th that did it, you know. And yeah. um, I don't think I've ever stopped. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, the consciousness that comes from, first of all, experiencing, you know, the journey from Mexico to Tijuana to East L.A. and then having to be a translator of reality for your parents and seeing, you know, the, the racist, horrible treatment to them and then that translating to you and then it hitting full front, you know, where you see people that look like you now killed. And the story that you tell right now that even in your own home, you get challenged, that you don't belong. You know, and I think all that consciousness of, you know, to our spirits, to who we are, to who we are supposed to be, then stimulates something in us. And and I think, you know, uh, uh, no, I know, and I don't just think, I know, that the ancestors were guiding you. 
you know, on this journey. Because, you know, on this journey, you then, you know, became a journalist, a, a writer for Lowrider Magazine. I know that's where I met you. And then further met you when there was a horrible, you know, situation with the police that is very reflective of everything that's going on today. And yeah. not wanting to take you back there, but I, I, I just want to acknowledge, you know, that sense of, of you fighting for justice, of, of writing for justice, and of speaking truth, and how that's not an easy journey. And, and, you know, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah. And for this, I don't mind at all. Mm. Um, anybody who's ever lived trauma, heavy trauma, it's not healthy, you know. But sometimes there's exceptions, you know. Mm. And precisely what you said. Sometimes because people haven't heard it. Because how do you listen to somebody who's dead? Mm. You know, that is, if somebody gets killed by a cop, I mean, they can't speak anymore. You know, a family member or a friend perhaps can speak, right? But it's not the same thing. You're not hearing it direct from the person, right? So someone like myself, there's thousands of people like me that have been brutally beaten. I lived and I was able and have been able to talk about it all these years. It wasn't healthy either. But I, I was a member of a group called uh, Survivors of Torture and Political Violence. To the last person, I said, we don't want to do this work. You know, we don't want to do this. But there's no option, you know, because if we don't do it, who else will? And I found myself like that throughout my life since. You know, I was 24. You know, I, I know you know, but I'll, I'll spend a, like two minutes maybe to explain yeah. what happened. Yeah. But it, it was the opening night of Boulevard Nights, a movie about cruising and Whittier Boulevard. I came upon a youngster that was wearing a sarape. And make a long story short, the cops saw him in the middle of the street and they chased him. And he went about the equivalent of about three stores running backwards. They um, caught up to him and just beat him vicious. I was leaving <laughs> because I had seen like over 100 cops on the boulevard that night. And I didn't want nothing to do with that. A lot of them were my neighbors out there and uh, people who knew I worked for the magazine. So they were like, hey, isn't that your job? <laughs> you know, to photograph. I said, of course it's my job, but I'm not going to get killed. You know, I saw how vicious they were being. So I started to leave, but as I was leaving, it's like everything became like, you couldn't hear anything anymore. Mm. It's like total silence, except for the hueco sound of the sticks mm. beating his body, you know? And I just couldn't leave. <laughs> so I went back, took photos. Uh, last one was one of the cops pointing at me. And then I ended up in the hospital, you know? Oh, and they hid me. You know, they wouldn't tell anybody where I was. But I, finally they did. And uh, as I tried to leave, they told me, oh, you, you've been charged with assault with a deadly weapon and assault and battery on four police officers. Mm. So I had eight, eight felonies against me. I uh, went to court for nine months, about 30 different times. And they finally did drop it. We mm. filed a lawsuit. Another attorney filed a lawsuit. And then for seven years, you know, waited and waited and waited. And two days before the trial, the attorney dropped the case, oh. called my house. My brother called me and he says, hey, your attorney called or his assistant. Uh, you're on trial in two days. Good luck. Get yourself another attorney. Mm -hmm. So I went back to my original attorney. I'll skip all the drama, but I went back to the original attorney. He took the case for 36 days. We went to court. I think it was about 10 days of deliberation and I won, mm. or I should say we won. And, uh, you know, that took me into a whole different world. Yeah. Those seven and a half years, I got arrested over 60 times, either pulled over or arrested, probably harassed even more time, but I stopped counting. <laughs> mm. It was a lot, you know? And, uh, so I know that world, you know, and it's not pleasant. And, you know, there's also something that you very well know that, there's a justification for people being very frustrated when they see, you know, somebody or a case on television or in the media, and it's an African-American mm. and people get frustrated, but they don't know how to speak. And mm. so what they speak is anti-blackness. Yeah. And so I don't like that, you know, uh, I don't like to hear that because it, it's true what they're saying that like we're invisibilized, you know. But that doesn't translate into blaming the black community. Yeah. If anything, that's the government and the media. And so when I've heard stuff like that, that's personally why I've never stepped away. I go, the last thing I want to hear is people like us, brown people, attacking black people, you know? Yeah. 
or, or native or Asian, etc. Because all of us, you know, the three groups, native, black and brown, have been getting it forever. The Asian population, they've been subjected more to vigilante violence. Yeah. And that's due to the government or, you know, the ex-president. And it's always been that way, but I think more recent. Anyway, so that's partly why I, I don't step away. And, I, you know, sometimes that may, maybe that bothers people. But I, I just I don't see this as competition, but rather people need to know that it happens to the, yeah. these three groups, you know, yeah. four groups and more other groups, too. Yeah. Well, you know, um, I appreciate you being willing to share. I was privileged to be with you during those times. And, and I saw the trauma. I saw it in you. I saw what you mm -hmm. carried. I saw what you dealt with. And I really just want to acknowledge you for not giving up the battle because you carried the trauma that you symbolically carried, but so many, many hundreds and hundreds of you know, people of color experienced. And you carried it and didn't give up. You created a voice for it. You created writings for it. You created movements for it, you know, and then wrote books that included, you know, those stories in it, you know. And so, and I, and I don't think, you know, people realize that the trauma doesn't go away. Mm -hmm. You may learn how to deal with it. You may, you know, you're a runner, so you run and that helps you, you know, about, you know, traditional ceremony and you do that and that helps you too, but it doesn't go away, you know. And so you being now on this road for a long time, you know, have chosen, have chosen that this is part of your carga, but it's also part of your sacred purpose, you know. And, you know, I just want to appreciate you for that, Roberto, and, and really acknowledge you for that. I mean, to the extent that you go on to have get a PhD, you know, in spite of everything, in a university that sometimes doesn't understand either, and then begin to share these teachings with that next generation, you know. So, you know, with that, I wonder if you can talk about your work, you know, past sure. or present work, and talk about, you know, the meaning of that and what really uh, is at the core of that. Yeah. Well, two things. First is that you're right. You know, I've actually gone through therapy. You know? mm -hmm. I resisted it pretty much my whole life because I used to say, yeah. why don't the cops get therapy? I go, they're yeah. the ones that are sick. Really? Yeah. I said, uh, I get well, I get therapy, I get well, and they go beat somebody else or kill mm -hmm. somebody else. Mm -hmm. go, it seems to me like they need the therapy. Yeah. Until finally, I just thought I had to do that for myself, you know, so mm -hmm. I, I did that. Um, regarding the, the PhD, and, and I went to the University of Wisconsin, uh, Madison, and I mentioned, I think if not mentioned, I alluded to PTSD. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's what the therapy was for. But I actually had something else that was even, I think, probably worse than PTSD, which is called TBI, traumatic mm -hmm. brain injury. Yeah. And, and like you said, it's not that it doesn't go away. It's just that the killings don't stop, you know, yeah. mm -hmm. because I feel fine and I feel normal. But then somebody else gets killed, you know, and again, over and over and over. Like Rodney King, for example, he wasn't killed. And yet that was equally traumatizing, right? Because mm -hmm. I think the whole world saw something that if you grew up in L.A., everybody knew that. Well, not just L.A. I mean, any barrio where people of color live, we've all known that. So the, the trauma, I think that... When I went for the PhD, I think they call it ebb and flow, you know, mm -hmm. that is sometimes it's heavy, sometimes not so much. Yeah. I think it wasn't that heavy for me at the time, you know, but it's still there. Right. Yeah. And I think not until much later when uh, Brown out of uh, Missouri, mm -hmm. Ferguson, Missouri. Yeah. I think what's, when all, all that came back in a big way, you know, so living with all that, you know, it is difficult, but like you say, Brown can't speak anymore, you know, mm. or Floyd can't speak. So it's kind of like, well, so who can speak? Right. Often the families are, are the ones left to speak, you know. There are also survivors, you know, like myself. But I, I can guarantee you in those days that we're talking about, those seven and a half years, I would meet all kinds of people. I remember this one woman. Oh, I remember when my book came out. She was frantic, you know, that she needed to tell me the story about how they killed her husband. And she was just telling me that and I was signing books, you know, and I just put the pen down. I said, oh, you know what? I'm a journalist. Forget this signing book stuff. You know, tell me I'll, I'll, I'll follow up with this, you know? And then I said, so when did this happen? Hmm. And she says, I forgot. And then she went to her daughter and she says, uh, when did your dad get killed? He goes, oh, that was 20 years ago. Hmm. 
She was frantic, like it had happened that week. You know? Right. I remember also speaking to um, other people. I remember one of them says, like, you know, my husband hasn't come out of his, you know, they had a two-story house. Mm -hmm. He hasn't come out of his second floor in seven years. Mm. You know, I'm sure he went to the bathroom or something. But in other words, literally, yeah. I know people like that, that that shock is so heavy. In my first book, I think it was, his name was Hugh something. He was one of the top police brutality experts, a lawyer. And he said, he's talking about head strikes, you know, about people mm. that get clubbed on the head. And he says, lucky are the ones that die, you know. Mm. And at the time, I wasn't sure what he was talking about completely. But through the years, I've, I've, of course, I understand it completely because it's exactly what you said. It doesn't leave you, you know. Mm. It's there. And every time somebody gets, now, if somebody were to disappear, take off and, you know, forget about everything, maybe. But if you're alive and you read, you read the newspapers or watch television and you hear about a case, of course it's going to trigger. Yeah. You know, something that I think a lot of people here will, will understand. Imagine a rape survivor mm -hmm. watching videos of women getting raped, you know, yeah. women or men. But, you know, a rape survivor doing that. When I wrote my book, uh, Yolki, that's what I did. I, I saw over a thousand videos of people getting killed. I think out of a thousand, maybe, maybe five got convicted. And most killings or even beatings, most of them are not televised or filmed. Yeah. So you think that out of the thousand where you have the evidence right in front of you, that it's like a sure conviction. I remember this one case, I think it was out of Pomona, but the guy had his hands up in the air and they were, you can hear them screaming at him and he doesn't do anything. He doesn't even move just had his hands up in the air. Mm -hmm. And then out of the blue, they just shoot him. And then the video, about 20 cops stepped forward. So about 20 cops had shot the guy. And then the media reported that he had gone into the car and reached for a weapon. They didn't know there was a video. So the video, like I said, all he had is his arms up in the air. And that's what we deal with all the time. Even with that, nobody got convicted. Mm -hmm. The chief of police backed up his officers. That's why when we talk about impunity, that's what impunity is. You have evidence, doesn't matter. Yeah. So that's, that's the work that I've done. Like I said, it's, it's not even a matter whether it's good or bad or healthy or not healthy. It's just something that has to be done. Yeah. And, you know, it's like the people that I met from the Middle East, from Africa, from South America, Central America. It's like, no, you accept that. Like you said, it's a carga. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes you included. I have a lot of friends who are healers, you know. I still remember the group um, Calmecac. Yeah, yeah. So Solis, I remember Flaca. Flaca, yeah. So a few people, right, that I've stayed in contact through the years. And I, I saw that you had a Raquel the other day as, yeah. on the program. You know, I'm surrounded pretty much by healers everywhere. Mm. And that's a good thing for me, because otherwise <laughs> it might just be a little difficult. Yeah. And even now, like when I moved to Totihuacan, in my mind, I was like, I'm, I'm out of there. You know, I don't want to do that anymore, but I'm still right in the middle of it. Right. You know, just the last thing about this topic is that I got together some friends around the country and we're going to have a national conference in San Bernardino mm -hmm. in the fall, mm -hmm. primarily because of all the things that I mentioned, you know, we're going to invite all different peoples of color, you know. It's pretty much raza centered, but we want to have Asian peoples, native, black, you know, all the different groups that get treated as less than human. We want them to be there. The reason I say raza centered is because, you know, the numbers that we've gone over, our numbers are through the roof, but nobody knows that. Yeah. People think like, you know, like again, the society we live in pretty much black and white. So people think, oh, well, it's just the blacks primarily and maybe a few others here and there. No, it's not like that. I mean, our numbers are way up there. This is my research that I've done, is that when I started going over the statistics, what I would find is people like with names like Garcia, Lopez, Gonzalez, they would be in the unknown category. Mm -hmm. And I'd be, wait a minute, Gonzalez, Martinez, no, that's not the, that's not unknown, that, that there's a category. We may not like the category, you know, because they usually use white, black, Hispanic, other, and unknown. I said, well, I think Garcia probably goes into the Hispanic category. Mm -hmm. Then I remember checking into the white category, same thing, same names, but they're in the white category. 
I go, something's not right here. The last three years, they've been dumping like everybody. The biggest racial category, but from the Washington Post, has been the unknown category. Mm. It's almost like they've given up trying to figure out who's getting killed. Right. But we can figure, you know, if you just go by last names, we know that Garcia, et cetera, et cetera. The numbers are pretty much the same, black and brown. And indigenous peoples, you know, American Indians, uh, have a higher rate. Not that many people, you know, uh, numbers-wise. In terms of rate, it's up there. So that's why I say these three populations, three, three different people, we should all be working together. Mm -hmm. And also Asians, because Asians, like I said, not as much killed by law enforcement, but they are killed by vigilantes. Mm. And one other topic that's related, which I didn't think was related until I started getting closer to that work, is what people call murdered and missing indigenous women. Mm. African-American women are also in that category, and so are migrant women. So I thought that was a whole different topic, but it's related. All of it is. And you know what the, the commonality is? Is the judicial system. When I talk about dehumanization, why do they kill black people? Why do they kill brown? Why do they kill indigenous? Why are murdered and missing indigenous African-American migrants? Why, why, why does that exist? The judicial system doesn't see us or treat us as human. Yeah. And in the case of the murdered and missing indigenous women, there are no investigations. And of course, even if there were, the same phenomena of impunity out of the thousands and thousands, I mean, there's like tens of thousands of people being killed. And you can probably use your two hands and you might get that many convictions, but most of them get off. Yeah. That is nine months probation, maybe. Remember the killer of the, the guy from Oakland? I think it was Oscar Grant. His mm -hmm. killer got off in nine months. Mm -hmm. That's if you even get that far. Yeah. If you don't have an investigation, you're not going to get an indictment. Yeah. No indictment, no trial. Right. And even if they lose, like I said, they, they get off. So that's the work that we're doing, Yeah, that I'm doing for sure. It's such important work, then, and I really want to bring in the duality of that because, you know, the one side is you're talking about justice and, and equity and accountability across the board by who, whoever commits, you know, the, the right. brutality and the violence. But the other part that's equally as important is the trauma. That even when somebody's accountable and you and they get convicted, which doesn't happen very often, the victim still stays with the trauma. The victim still stays with the resonance of the brutality and the injustice and the inhumanity that stays within your spirit, you know. And I think that remembering back to the situation with you, you know, we we were a grupito carmeca, you know, we were doing indigenous healing, we were reaching out to communities that nobody wanted to to be around and and fortunately, when the situation happened with you, we were there, too, to support you in any way. And out of that, we began to learn that we needed to really cultivate and teach and live our own traditional healing practices. You know, you mentioned therapy. That's definitely one avenue that's available. I know that running is very significant for you. I know writing is very significant for you as well. I wonder if you could just mention you know, what has helped you heal? What has helped you yeah. maintain your balance? You know, other than the things that I mentioned, what, what are those things that you yeah. found that have really been part of, uh, you know, your healing path? Well, being surrounded by healers is probably number one, mm. you know, and it's related to the running too. Yeah. I remember when I did get the therapy, I went in one day, I told her, I said, I think I'm healed. And she said, I agree, but I want you to explain why. I said, you know, when I don't feel good, I run. When I feel great, I run. So all I have to do is run and I feel great. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I met this other uh, neuro, I forget what he was. He was one of the top people in uh, the field of trauma, Vandes, Vandenberg or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I presented my research on Maïs, and he told me afterwards, he says, you know, the way people heal is when they find something more important in, in their life than the trauma that they live. Mm. So he said, what you presented here, I can tell you've superseded that trauma because you have that enthusiasm for that maize work. And I'll be brief about the maize, but when I went uh, to the University of Wisconsin for the master's and PhD, it was about corn. It was about who we are, about where we come from, what we're made of. Wow. And I remember those are the words I remember from my father. 
So I remember when my dad was, he had already Alzheimer's. And I used to talk to him about my PhD. He still had memories. And my, my rest of my family thought he didn't have memory anymore. And I said, no, he does. He always continues to tell me stories, you know, about the old days and on and on. But I think the title of my dissertation was Sentel Sintli, a 7,000-year ceremonial discourse. And that was really a, a basis of the conversations I would have with my father. Uh, Maïs is critical to the work that I do. You know, I can't ignore, obviously, the violence, because that's part of me, too. But my academic work has pretty much been in the field of Maïs and Maïs cultures. The idea being is that Maïs is who we are. Yeah. That that's where we come from. So when people tell us to get the hell out of here, that we are where we come from, you know, mm -hmm. that is, we come from the entire continent. You know, scientists say we are what we eat. So we eat maize, you know, we eat, you know, the elote. We have uh, tortillas, obviously, but also the corn, bean, squash. And I always say, don't forget the chile because <laughs> that's uh, <laughs> critical. But, you know, over here too, the uh, maguey and the nopal are also important. You know, I think they say 60% of all the world's crops are from here, from the Americas. Right. So uh, we've actually contributed to the world. But I think for us, and I think for my discipline, you know, in the field of Chicana and Chicano studies, that that work, and I'm very proud of it, you know, maybe I'm overstating it, but I think not. Because when I was introduced to the concept of Chicana and Chicano studies, the beginning date was 1848. A war, you know, we we're a product of a war. Later, it was 1519 or even 1492, the idea of mestizaje. We were created as a result of an invasion. And I remember this didn't sound right to me. And when I started to do this work on origins and migrations, I remember coming across an elder, many actually, but one of them specifically says, hey, are you looking where you came from? on this project of origins and migrations. Are you looking where you came from or where the Aztecs came from? Mm. And I said, I don't know. I never really thought about it, but I think I'm looking for where I came from. And he said, that's what I thought. Because you're not going to find your story on a map. You want to know who you are? Follow the corn. Follow the maize. You know? mm. And so that's what I did. Yeah. And sure enough, prior to that, the discipline taught that we were the product of a war or an invasion. With this concept of maize, it's like, no, we're part of many peoples and many cultures that began, you know, symbolically when maize was created, which is over 7,000 years old. Yeah. You know, some of us probably can say, no, well, actually, we come even much further back. So, of course, but I think in terms of the symbol of the maize, the symbol of what people call civilizations, it's all based on the maize for the most part. Mm -hmm. And we never stopped eating other things either, obviously, but... Of course, if you include the tamal, they say that's even before the tortilla. I think they used to put everything in there. I personally think when times were lean, that's probably when the tortilla came about, you know, made yeah. it real, made it real thin. It. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But anyway, so that, that's the work that I do, you know. The, yeah. You know, I mean, but what you're really talking about is such a significant thing because we're really talking about the sacredness of who we are, right? Exactly. And, and you're healing in working with the corn and working with the maize was really about revalidating the sacredness of who Roberto is in spite of how you had been treated or violated or disenfranchised. You, on this path, whether knowing it cognitively or not, you went on the path to recover and to discover again and to uncover the sacredness of who you were. And in that, you lifted that message and gave so many people that validation that we are here. We are who we are. We do come from our food. And the interesting thing is you say 60% of you know the food in the world comes from us. We have fed the world. And so people have us in them, the hands and the spirit of our people that cultivate all the crops are in the spirits of everyone around the world. So one way or another, we are a part of them. You know, the in la quets, do it in the otro, you are my, uh, yeah. we are integrated. You can't get rid of us. You can't ignore us. You can't push us out, even though we recognize, you know, even as you, as you so brilliantly articulated, on the demographics, there's no place for us. They don't want to put, they want to put us through the whites, so they want to just make us unknown. We are here. 
and we ain't going no place. And you know, and you yeah. being one of the, you know, the warriors and the writers and the speakers on that sense of cultivating your identity in its sacredness, recognizing that we deserve to be treated as human, deserve to be treated with dignity, and then we must fight against injustice is is such an important legacy that, that you know, you have uh, cultivated, Roberto, and I, I want to appreciate you for that. I want to acknowledge you for that, you know, because it hasn't been an easy path. And people see me, see you, see other people that have, oh, wow, you guys are this, you're authors. And, well, it hasn't been an easy path. And even being a doctor, even being an author, even being all of that, it still isn't easy because we still get challenged for what we speak about and what we share, you know. But, you know, Absolutely. recognizing that, you know, you are an elder. You have been on this road a long time, you know, and I really want to give you the opportunity to share some consejos, to share some advice, to share some counsel yeah. for that next generation, you know, because, you know, you have a lot of teachings to share. Well, one thing I wanted to affirm, I have a story about what you just said mm. that was really satisfying. You know, when my book, Our Sacred Baez, when it first came out, right. I went to an elementary school and it was kids from literally three years old to eight years old. Mm -hmm. And I told them the stories of corn, including the birth of maize and Quetzalcoatl and the ants. Mm -hmm. And those kids understood it. Same stories I would give to my students at the graduate right, level right. at the University of Arizona yeah. or undergraduate. But I went to another school and I told the stories, the same stories about how the ants brought the corn to Quetzalcoatl to feed the, the corn to the people who couldn't move because they had no food. And so the teacher had told me stuff about the whole class, including this one little kid. He was, I think, from the Jamaica or Dominican Republic. I, right now, I don't remember, but, you know, physiologically, he looks black, right? Mm -hmm. So when I'm telling these stories about, about Quetzalcoatl and the ants, the little kid raises his hand. And he says, uh, is that my story, too? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, remembering what the teacher had told me, I said, where are you from? And again, he said either Dominican or Jamaica. And I said, do you know what the word maíz, you know, where that comes from? Because it comes from where you come from. Mm. Maíz is a Taino word. It comes from where, where you come from. Mm. His eyes lit up. Mm. And next thing you know, I had an instant friend for like half an hour. <laughs> he, wouldn't, <laughs> he wouldn't let go of me. And he would just, everybody kept taking pictures. And oh, it was the coolest thing because, you know, because I, I know that like when we talked about the Chicano movement or different movements, sometimes we become insulated, you know, maybe yes. not on purpose, but we're fighting for our own, et cetera. Right. But I never liked that really. I mean, because to me, it's like we're human. That means we have something in common with everyone. So the idea is to treat everyone and to be treated as full human beings. So when I saw that and what you said a second ago, I said, yeah, I think food indigenizes. So does the land. It envisionizes. And so that was awesome. You know, I, that was something special. And that's, that's the reason why, you know, I began writing children's books. Yeah. Because, you know, for my own kids, I wanted them to know who they were. But, you know, we were working with kids and for them to be able to, to feel, you know, sacred and honored for who they were. You know, and, and I think, you know, and, and maybe maybe after we finish, we'll talk about maybe we write a children's oh, book absolutely. together. You know, we... Speaking of which, see, one, one thing I wanted to add is that you yeah. alluded to it, but you didn't really say it. So when I worked at Lowrider Magazine, you know, we asked you and Kalmekak to write a column. Or maybe you proposed it. All I know is we, we wanted to collaborate, and we did, right? We had this column. Yeah. It was called uh, Escucha la Tia Chucha, right? Something like that? Yeah. Right, right. Well, yes. if you think about it, I mean, actually, you would know, but most people probably didn't know that. But that was affirming because most of the people that read Lowrider Magazine a huge percentage were in Jupiter Hall or prison or on the streets. Right, right, right. And those are the right. ones that are always treated not only bad, but are always harassed by cops and on and on and on. So yeah. to me, I thought that was that was really awesome. And I know you've talked about that being a book too, so we can do that or you can do it, you know? Yeah, well, you know, and that was such an eye-opening thing for me because, you know, as we were getting all these letters, and you're right, a lot from people behind the, the gate and the bars over there, you know, they just wanted affirmation that in spite of what they've gone through, that they still had a sacredness in them. And they had, you know, issues and problems, but they were really, how do I make amends with my family? How do I make amends with my kids? How do I get, you know, 
they really wanted to come back to a sense of sacredness. And and we got hundreds and hundreds of letters. It was amazing. I still have a lot of those letters, like I said, but it was that connection that you, again, brought what you experienced to the aspect of healing and making that connection. And I think that that has been the journey, at least, you know, between you and I and the work that we've done, you know, the connection between the cargas and regalos, the, you know, the struggles and the healing, you know, that way. And so, you know, with that in mind, Roberto, um, you know, share some 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 counsel, some advice for that next generation. Uh. Yeah, well, I think, you know, this, I don't know if I learned it my whole life, but absolutely during my Arizona days, which was about 15 years. You know, being from L.A., I always remember the walkouts. Well, in Arizona, in Tucson, we had something very similar, except instead of six months, it lasted 12 years. It was just a huge battle you know, of what we could teach or what we couldn't teach. We probably had about two to three protests per week for about three years nonstop. And one thing that I noticed and realized, and several other people noticed it too, but we noticed is that whenever the governor did anything or whenever the state school board superintendent or the school board president, because, you know, there was a lot of radical right-wing extremists running everything over there. Mm -hmm. Whenever they did something, we would react. If uh, the governor showed up somewhere, we protested. So we call it resist. But in my mind, I said, we're resisting, of course, but we're also reacting. That is, you could say that we acted by creating Chicana and Chicano studies. Okay, We did that, right? 50-some years ago, 52 years ago. And in the high schools, maybe later. But we actually acted first. They reacted, okay? But in this battle, it was always us reacting. And so we said, you know what? We need to start creating. They can react. You know, we create, they react, you know? Mm. So the idea came about. And this is, if anything I could share, it would be this. The concept of creation resistance. That is, you know, you could just create and make all these beautiful things. But if you live in the midst of heavy-duty oppression like what existed in Arizona. I don't mean to put down hippies, but I always use this analogy. I said, it's just like wanting to be a hippie in the midst of all this stuff. And you don't really worry about the police. You don't worry about the that the, that uh, banning of books, the censoring of books, the censoring of knowledge, a worldview. You don't worry about it. You just create. I said, no, you got to do both. You know, Because it's like, yeah, we don't live in a paradise. We live in a heavy duty environment. And, you know, what's worse now is that whatever we did, and, and for me, it was like, well, I want to create curriculum. I want to create material. That's what the, our Sacred Maize book was about. It was in, in the middle of all of that. And I said, well, we need one day, all that stuff, will, maybe it'll be over. But we need something to create. And so for me, that's what I did. Bjorki was later, and then mm -hmm. even another one after that. I think that... For anybody that's involved in movements, that that's very important and very key. Otherwise, all we do is react. Like I said, we call it resist, but I don't think human beings were meant to only resist. You know, I think we need to be able to tap all the cool stuff in the world. You know that we are part of yeah. and create. You know, whether it's the arts, the culture, the music, everything. Otherwise, again, we just become reactive human beings. And mm -hmm. that's, that's what I've observed throughout my life, you know, that sometimes people get bitter, other times people get burnout. Yeah, so, yeah. so to prevent that, I think creation is critical. So we do both. Mm -hmm. I think we're all good. And it is, if you can want to use the term healing, I think it's very healing. It's not something you have to wait for. You know, you don't have to wait till you win something. No, you can do it yeah. as... We're living, you know, create and resist. Mm. So this was Arizona. Okay, you know, in California today, in the state of California, you cannot teach in Lakesh, you cannot teach the Nawi Olin, and you cannot teach Ashe. That's a Yoruban concept, you know. Those three indigenous concepts cannot be taught in California. People used to say, oh, well, it's because Arizona is all reactionary. California is the liberal bastion of the world, and yet those cannot be taught there. So our battles have to continue, you know, and people have to keep creating. Because I'm a strong believer, as, as you know, I've been on, in a Calpoli for 15 years or even longer. You know, so I, I do know and I do participate, mostly ceremonial running. But I always hear people talk about that we need to go back. And in my mind, I'm saying, 
we don't need to go back only, you know, that's one component. The other part is the creation. As long as you're alive, you can create. Because I've run into archaeologists and anthropologists who right. think like, ah, oh, they're doing it wrong. It's like, wait a minute, if they're alive, they can do whatever they want. You know, so we as peoples, you know, if we are on that good journey, on that spiritual journey, and if we need to do something, you know, like I don't think they had police brutality in the pre-Columbus days, you know. Sometimes you have to adapt, you know, and create. Yeah. You know, I think what you're saying is, you know, fundamental. Because I think we start from creation, mm -hmm. you know. We, we, our mama brings us into the world, you know, where our ancestors' dreams, you know, coming in. And, you know, there is resistance, mm -hmm. obviously, in even coming into the world. But if we're greeted and welcomed and acknowledged in a good way, then the creation continues. And I think, you know, we as people in this world, especially indigenous people, especially those that are disenfranchised, we must continue to create our reality, but create the reality we want for that next generation as well. And I think that we have medicine, we have teachings, we have, you know, spirit, we have ways of grounding ourselves in that, but also of moving it forward. And, you know, Roberto, you've been one of those if you will, activators, uh, waters of creation, stimulators of creative thought, of creative movement, but also, you know, uh, creative resistance. And, and somebody was asking me the other day, you know, about that sense of resistance. I said, you know, sometimes love is resistance. Doing things in a loving way is resisting getting hateful, resisting being oppositional to everything. Sometimes, you know, you just need to do it with love. Con ganas, of course. And, you know, with a sense of dignity, but that creative part of how to figure out how to do that is really where the prayer comes in, because sometimes it is difficult. And I think you've been a prime example of how we get there. You know, I want to um, really encourage people to, and you know, if you haven't read, you know, Roberto's books, check them out, buy them. I'm sure they're on Amazon every place, but uh, read his columns and, and connect with him too, you know, and there's a lot going on that he's doing throughout the country, but in Mexico también. I'm sure he'd welcome a visit if you, you want to come and, and help with with the creation of, uh, of everything that's going on there. You know. Can, can I add a closing? Sure, go ahead. That'll be brief, but you mentioned at the beginning, and I mentioned it also about being a runner, you know, and it's basically ceremonial running. And that's what I learned and how I learned this concept I'm going to explain right now, that I was taught and, and have been told that when you know somebody or meet somebody, a lot of times they say beautiful words, but if you want to know who they are, look at their footprints. Mm. In other words, the footprints as a runner, you know, that, that means something, but the footprints in terms of life, you know, you say something, look at the footprints. And if they live that life, you know, and you can see it in the footprints, that's going to tell you more than what people say. So that's what I, I want to end with, the, the idea that like it isn't mm -hmm. only about knowing and learning and reading and yeah. you know doing all these cool things, including ceremony. That is, you do all of that, but also observe those footprints, because that's going to tell you whether it's true or whether it's just talk. Wow. Yeah. Walk the talk, brother. Thank you so much for, for your walking and your talking and your sharing. And, you know, I really want to thank you all for listening today and really reinforce that sense of creation, that sense of, of identity, the sense of sacredness in all of us that, you know, our brother Roberto brings. You know, look up the website, look up our website as well, National Compadres Network, even mine, where the children's books are, and give us some feedback, you know, along the way. Let's do this together. Let's continue cultivating the sacredness of all people, and let's resist the dehumanization that happens so much uh, throughout the world so that our next generation has more love and more sacredness and less of the other side. We thank you very much and uh, blessings to everyone. Klaasu Komande. For more information about Healing Generations and the Healing Generations Institute, visit nationalcompadresnetwork.org and be sure to subscribe to stay up to date with our new releases.